Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are strictly the views or opinions of the presenter. Nothing in here is the view of the firms, corporations, financial entities that anybody represents. Uh, nothing expressed here is a view of any um, regulator or semi-regulatory agency. Uh, all content is intended to be educational. Nothing in this episode construes specific investment advice. And if you do require advice, you should seek an appropriate advisor, be that a financial planner or a tax advisor or possibly a lawyer. Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. Uh, in this episode, I'll be interviewing Amanda, who's a, an insurance wholesaler and uh, really just great person all around. I send a lot of people to Amanda for industry advice when uh, when people are looking for um, career advice or that kind of thing. Um, I find Amanda's just she's such a good person to talk to, great listener, all that. So, um, and you'll hear in the interview here that she's very patient with me. Um, so we have uh, CE credits today. It's a life insurance episode. So life insurance credits in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario. Um, no ANS credits in Alberta. Um, it will be good for an advocate's IAS credit, a financial planning credit on the FP Canada side, a professional development credit with IROC, and a tax planning um, credit with MFDA. Uh, the object for today is a plaque. There it is. Um, so I'm a big proponent of coaching. This is my business coaching group. Again, there's uh, Tech Canada is my coaching group. And I've been there for three years now, um, and they've helped with my coaching group is just awesome. Um, helped with a bunch of issues, uh, the biggest being sort of navigating the sale of our business, which is a difficult thing to do. It's uh, you know, fraught with uh, financial risk. There's emotional issues, all kinds of stuff there. Um, if you don't have a coaching group or a coach, uh, go find one. It's it's great. Uh, there's tons of good um coaching financial advisors out there, or sorry, uh, coaches for financial advisors out there. Um, and actually we've had a financial coach on before for clients as well. Way back in season one, we had uh, Russ Dick in Calgary on and he does uh, financial coaching. Okay, let's uh, get into the episode. Lots of content here. Uh, you got to put on your uh, thinking hat for this one. Amanda has tons and tons of wisdom, tons of knowledge and uh, really good to go through it. Hi, I'm here today with Amanda. Amanda is an insurance wholesaler and uh, recent, uh, recently completed a whole bunch of programs, Amanda, right? Your I know, TEP had just finished and uh, CFP not that long ago, CLU sort of in between there, right? You've been busy on the education side recently, which is, of course, a big favorite of mine. Um, so can you give us a little rundown? Who are you? What do you do, Amanda? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I work for one of the major insurers and I'm located here in Edmonton with you, which I guess is um, part of the reason of how I stumbled upon the Business Career College as well. And uh, Penny definitely encouraged me to get involved with the education there. Uh, but I am actually originally from Waterloo. So I always say in Waterloo, you kind of have two options after school and you can go into tech or you can go into insurance and I can barely work my iPhone. So uh, here we are in insurance. Perfect. All right. Um, you've been in Edmonton for quite a while now, eh? Six or seven years? Almost five. Okay. All right. Time has lost all meaning to me now. So it's uh, it really has. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, and of course, you're a wholesaler on the insurance side. Um, so does that mean do you spend most of your time with advisors? Do you have a client facing role there at all? Or I guess I know advisors are your clients, but. Uh, how often do you find yourself sitting across from the advisor's client? Um, not as often. So, I mean, really as a wholesaler, my main role is to work and support the advisor. Um, occasionally I'll get asked to join client meetings and uh, we'll jump in to help answer questions. Uh, I don't actually carry an insurance license though. So when I am in those client meetings, really my job is to be there as the expert and ask questions, but not to make any recommendations to the client. Uh, that would be up to the advisor to make the actual recommendations. Perfect. And of course, uh, your team, 
uh, you and Matthew, very education oriented. Um, is this a function of the role? Is it sort of encouraged in your role or is it something that maybe you feed off of one another here? How has this come about? Uh, so it's kind of a combination of both, I guess. Um, it is encouraged, but really I think also for both myself, you, myself and Matthew is it's part of our personality. We like to be engaged. We like to know more and constantly be expanding our knowledge. Um, so really combination with the encouragement from head office to go out there and get that extra education and designations, um, as well as just kind of who we are too. Perfect. Um, and maybe that's the Waterloo thing showing up a little bit, because that's another thing you can do in Waterloo, right? You can get yourself a good education. So. Uh, you can, yeah. We've got lots of good yeah. schools around there. That's it. Um, now, you recently did, as I mentioned earlier, finish out your uh, TEP, Trust and Estate Practitioner, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about how that was, and especially having gone through CFP, CLU just prior to that? Um, so the TEP, I uh, would kind of say it's the CFP, CLU on steroids. Um, so, you know, the CFP, you're starting to get a little bit of those glimpses into those things like trusts and estates. And really, you're getting a little bit of a lot of things. Um, the CLU is really starting to dig down into more so the estate planning side of things, um, both pers personally and corporately. Um, and then the TP takes all of those things that you learn in the CLU and just amplifies them. So what didn't I learn, I guess, when it came to estate and tax planning opportunities? Um, it was very intense, very in-depth. Uh, and the CLU, I mean, you need to know things provincially. But what I found with the TP, uh, especially for the first course, the law of trust, like I was printing off the Alberta legislation and reading the trustee act and the wills and succession act and really digging into the nitty gritty details there. Did you find then like having spent some time actually reading legislation and maybe some of the lawsuits that go along with that, is that something that you're gonna carry through? Like, do you still find yourself cracking open legislation to answer questions? How comfortable are you gonna be doing that? Well, I did happen to have a great teacher for the CFP who highly recommended this book, <laughs> uh, which is the Wealth Planning Strategies uh, for Canadians. And I had dug into that before I did the CLU and actually read it for some exam prep and having the chapters at the back of, uh, I guess, each topic there where it does dig into some of the provincially specific uh, items. I, well, as you can see, I have it within arm's reach. So I does stay within arm's reach of me at all times and getting into those things. Also, you know, sometimes you get into banter with coworkers or a topic or question comes up uh, when I'm talking to advisors and I will start digging into the legislation now and be like, well, wait, hold on. What act do I need to go to? What piece of it is it? Um, and then certainly the cases as well, I think are probably the things I find most interesting and uh, I mean, even years ago, one of the great things our tax and estate planning team does is publish what they call as a matter of law. And this is where they give kind of like a one page synopsis of a case and the outcome. And those were always my favorite publications that came out to read and just see some of the kind of craziness that goes on out there. Makes a ton of sense. And that book was uh, Wealth Planning Strategies for Canadians 2020, whatever year you have in front of you there. Yeah. And uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes because it is, you're quite right, a great book, um, whether you're preparing for your exams or just sort of daily use, so, or in your daily use. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the um, sort of credibility side here, how important was this in pursuing, I think CFP is kind of the expectation for a lot of wholesalers, but do you find now with, uh, like TEP is pretty intense, and do you find that um, this makes people sit back a little bit. Maybe they've got a little more time for what Amanda has to say, or does it matter? Do you find that that was also like always kind of the case and the, the folks that dealt with you just continue to deal with you or does it, does it matter carrying something like that? I think it does. Uh, I was very open about my education journey. And um, one of the great things about doing the CFP for you was I was able to actually match up with some other people that were in the city that were doing it. 
And so we partnered together and studied together uh, a lot during the CFP process. Uh, and just as a result, people knew that I was doing it. I was very open about talking about it in presentations and meetings. And then as it continued to the CLU and TEP, and um, I do get a lot of people calling me, asking me for advice on how should they pursue their CFP? Uh, what about the CLU? Did I find it valuable? And now certainly working with the TEP as well, uh, I do find I'm getting more in depth and more complex questions. Um, sometimes, you know, you get into that uh, level of what, I guess that line in the sand of where can you give advice and where can't you give advice. Um, but I think it does increase the credibility and certainly then just trying to relate that back to insurance sales and why does this matter? Uh, I just kind of rolled through the entire education process with, I guess, that at the back of my brain too. Okay. Um, it's, it is an interesting thing, like I think going through all that work and then, you know, where are you going to end up as far as that goes? Now, I'm, I have a couple of follow-on comments about specifically going through CFP here. So I occasionally run into it where a student says, well, I don't really want to tell everybody just in case I fail an exam or something like that. Do you have a response to that, Amanda? Um, I think these things make us human. Uh, and I mean, I get it. I get that fear. I certainly had it myself. And I mean, there was a lot of dread and I think a lot of pressure to perform going into the exams to make sure I did pass. So I didn't have to kind of tell everybody. But um, when I was going through my TEP, I failed my first law exam. And uh, I mean, I'll tell you the textbook was like in just thick and reading the legislation. And actually the legislation was easier to read than the textbook. Um, so just to give you an idea where it was, but I was kind of open and vulnerable um, with the people that knew that I was writing it and told them I wasn't successful at that first try, but um, I think it made me I think it just gives you more of a human aspect to it, right? And actually something really good came out of that because I didn't pass and I was able to learn some of the uh, resources that STEP had in place that weren't advertised very well at the time. And it got me in touch with the branch here in Edmonton and got me connected with what they had as a mentor program. So it connected me to some lawyers in town who were able to help me make sense of the material. And then on the second time I passed much bigger improvement. Um, and then Steph actually reached out to me too and asked me to join the board here as their student liaison. So I must not have been that annoying asking all my <laughs> questions, but uh, yeah, it, it, you know, that failure kind of cheesy, I believe everything happens for a reason. And that definitely led to some really good outcomes too. So, and yeah, I think it's humbling. not realistic to do the sort of a, like the number of exams that you did over that relatively short period of time and expect everything to go perfectly all the way along. I just think it's no matter who you are, I think that you have to be prepared for something to go wrong at some point. Absolutely. And I think a lot of the things too is sometimes it's how you write the exam. It's not necessarily the content or not necessarily understanding it. There's time pressures. Um, there's just so many factors that kind of factor into it. What side of the bed did you wake up on? So lots that can go wrong, but. 100%. And then the other is uh, the study group idea. And I've started to formalize this a lot more, actually. You know, I hear from folks like you or is a listener, Melanie, out there will know that she's been influential in this, where we've tried to put together a better um, better process for people to get paired up with study partners. Because it's nice if it happens by accident, but. Uh, be better if it was all by design so that's good thanks yeah i mean i was lucky because i could recognize the names on the call uh yeah. and it was easy enough for me to reach out to them but actually when we were doing the exam prep for the final cfp uh i think it's the final cfp might have been the first one but i had people private message me on zoom and we ended up forming some study groups through there too so uh it was a good way to you know, work together and bring different areas of expertise into it. Perfect. Now, going through TEP, of course, you come from a strong insurance background, where most of the folks going through that course would come from a strong legal or tax background. Um, what did you uh, 
let's say bring to the table then from that insurance background? Was that, did it influence how you studied or did it influence your coursework? Um, what showed up there? So I went into it, I guess, with a good base understanding of some of the strategies um, that we're getting out of it, like, you know, estate freezes, uh, and obviously having heard a lot of the presentations, you know, again, that our tax and estate planning team that would put together or places like Advocus would have meetings on, um, as well as I did have that good base level of knowledge going into it, as well, we have a ton of resources that ended up being really beneficial and uh, that I often send out to our study groups, um, whether they were recorded CE presentations or a lot of our white papers that we have online as well. Uh, again, when it comes to like dispositions or estate freezes and tax planning topics, legal matters, um, I was at least able to connect in that way. This seems like a good opportunity to mention the disclaimer. But of course, you are here today as yourself and not representing any given firm. That's true. Yes, I, uh, these are all my own opinions and not necessarily those of uh, the company that I work for. Perfect. Uh, now, I know that uh, you, because of the sort of work you do, uh, the wholesaler and the insurance mm -hmm. side, um, you're exposed a fair bit to leveraged insurance concepts. Um, yes. <laughs> whether or not people are uh, selling them, I think it's an area that there's a lot of questions about. Um, so can you take us through maybe the kinds of questions you get from agents out there about leverage insurance products? Maybe that's a good starting point for this. Um, for sure. So I think the leveraged uh, insurance product can be a really great strategy to show some of the flexibility that maybe changes that conversation from this is premium, this is a cost, um, and some of those negative connotations around insurance to this is really gonna benefit your estate. This is more of an investment. And here's the flexibility and the way to be able to access that cash during your lifetime if you need as well. So when we start getting into those questions, you know, a lot of it does come based on the illustrations and looking at those, helping design the product, um, connecting the dots and showing how, you know, how does this work at this percentage versus this percentage and kind of that high level overview, um, not getting into as much as the nitty gritty details when it comes to the tax planning. Um, but again, there's lots of resources that we can connect with when it does get into that. How much does the agent have to know? Uh, I mean, it is more complex, right? So yeah. I think it is something that, you know, if you're in your first year on the job, it's going to be really hard to go out there and to be able to position a leveraged insurance concept. I know when I was learning insurance and coming onto this team to begin with, I was able to learn the products, but then the piece that took a long time to learn or a while to learn was, okay, I understand how this works with term insurance and I understand how this works with whole life insurance and how this works with living benefits, but like, when would I use each one of these? And that's the piece that I found um, took a lot longer to learn. So when you start getting into something like leveraged insurance, where you're asking for large premiums, and there's often, especially in the corporate market anyways, um, some of those more bigger tax complexities behind it and legal complexities behind it. Um, certainly I understand that, uh, you know, it's not something that's gonna happen on day one. Does the agent have to be able to explain it in full to the client's accountant and maybe lawyer? Does some of that fall back to you? Do the lawyers and accountants figure it out? Where does that uh, take us? Uh, it all depends in each case is kind of individual. So we do, um, so most insurers, and I know we do as well, we have tax and estate planning teams that are there to assist in those conversations and help bridge that gap between the advisor and the accountant. Um, you know, my best piece of advice is get them involved in sooner than later when it comes to the client's accountant, because where I have seen things go wrong is not involving the accountant. And all of a sudden uh, the client's running it by 
and the accountant is putting a stop to that and the whole process kind of stops right then and there. So getting the accountant involved sooner rather than later uh, is the biggest piece of advice that I would give there. And then if there is additional assistance needed from there, that's where, you know, either your insurers, uh, tax and estate planning team, or a lot of the firms and the MGAs out there also have tax and estate planning teams as well. And they may actually get more involved in the process and in working directly with that client and helping to put that plan together um, too. Whereas as the wholesalers, we're really here for product and concept support um, with the advisor. So an area where I've seen things, I don't necessarily, necessarily want to say fall apart, but maybe not go as well as they could have. Um, I get this question from advisors occasionally where they ask me, like the accountant wants to know how to how to account for premiums paid here. Um, do you have resources that help the accountant out with that? Yeah, again, we have white papers on that actually. So there is one uh, directly at the accounting and how to account for um, life and living benefits policies. And whenever that comes up, I just send them over the article. Uh, the great thing about the white papers are is they're referencing the Income Tax Act and they're really meant for the accountant. I don't know, I'd put one in front of a client, but um, they're certainly there for the accountants. Now on the note of not putting it in front of the client, how much does the client have to understand? So I think the client needs to understand high level, right? What is this going to do for them? What are they committing to? And what are the areas of risk that might be involved with it as well? So where could things go wrong? And <clears throat> what's the flexibility surrounding it too? Okay. Now, can you give us a primer on some of the uh, typical leverage insurance concepts that are out there? Uh, for sure. So there's many ways to skin this cat, uh, I guess. And um, so... There really is, I guess, kind of two ways uh, when it comes to leveraging an insurance policy that you could come up to. Uh, the first one is through an actual policy loan. Uh, and there are some concepts out there in the market uh, that really focus heavily on accessing cash value in a life insurance policy through a policy loan through the insurer. Um, where that may not work, though, is that the policy loans do eventually become taxable. So depending on when the cash value starts exceeding the ACB, those could potentially become taxable down the road. Um, and that's where the collateral insurance comes in. And that's where you'll see those concepts like the insured retirement plan or IRP and the IFA or the immediate financing arrangement. So the way to keep it straight is IFA, I need the money now. This is immediate. I need the money now. I like the idea of the insurance plan, but I could put those dollars to better use somewhere else inside my company. The IRP is, I'm going to use this later on down the road. So I know I need the insurance, but I might also want to access that cash down the road to help supplement my retirement. And then... Uh, the, so the, the policy loan versus the collateral scenario, um, are there situations where you see a policy loan work well for leveraged concepts or do you always do collateral loan with IFA and IRP? What I mainly focus on is those collateral loans. Um, we don't support the policy loan uh, from a concept basis. So we don't have software that will illustrate that. Um, you know, if you are borrowing against it up front and looking at that, maybe the policy loan does work um, because oftentimes in those early years, there's not going to be a taxable consequence to do that. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge, of course, and you mentioned this rightly, is that with policy loans, once you borrow it over your cash surrender value, you're into taxable territory. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and of course, that gets more difficult as you get older, right, where the you start to grind down your ACB and all that goes along with that. So yeah, and the one thing I I you know think we don't necessarily do a good job of, and this is kind of you know not company specific, but generically overall, is we call it a disposition and a gain on a policy. But I think that connotates that we're talking about a capital gain, 
but it's not. It is actually an income inclusion, which means that there is a higher tax rate likely associated with it than capital gains. So I do find that is one thing that can sometimes be confused out there. It's a fair point, right? That uh, taxable policy gain is not the same as uh, capital gain. And I do see that um, confused all the time. And a notable area where I see confusion with that, that I think overlaps with your comment, Amanda, is where people assume that they can move a policy into the corporation using Section 85, right? That they think, because um, of course you can use Section 85 to move capital property into your corporation on a fairly tax efficient basis, but that treatment's not available for um, life insurance. So. Yeah. Um... Definitely. And I mean, we've got some really good resources when it comes to transfers of life insurance policies. Yes. Uh, it is a very complicated subject to get into. And um, a, one thing there too that I see as well is maybe not necessarily, um, we might not consider what the value is to be the same as what CRA considers is the value of a policy. And that's where they get into um some bigger complexities of, you know, how old is the policy? What is the client's health? Could they go out and repurchase that for the same rate? And those are things that contribute into the value that CRA wants. And those are uh, independent valuations that need to be done by an actuarial firm. Your insurance companies will not give you that valuation. So it is expensive to get those done. And in fact, uh, probably next week. So Wednesday, so this will go live sometime in May, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, I have uh, Fraser Lang from GBL on talking about this very issue. So. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I know. I love it. <laughs> you and I think that, but not, not everybody's going to think that. So, so yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so circling back to leverage, I don't want to catch you off guard here with insurance transfers, because um, of course, we're uh, really sitting here to talk about leverage insurance. Um, now, what about personally? Can you talk about a personal insured retirement at all? Is this something that you get involved with? Do you see much of this being done? Uh, probably to a lesser degree than the corporate borrowing, um, but it is something that's out there and it's a great way to help supplement retirement income. Um, where I like to see it is when a client has already maxed out some of their tax efficient savings already, right? So they've got some RSP built up or they've got some TFSAs built up. I don't think this is a replacement to RSPs or TFSAs, but I think this is a nice complement when we're running into those high income earners where they will have a lot of registered savings that could be affecting, you know, their OAS eligibility and everything down the road. Something I picked up from the CFP. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, you can't get away from it. And I think you're right, though, to say a supplement to your retirement income. I think it can work out really well there. Um, I don't know if you have a thought about this, but me personally, I'm not a big fan of it where I see it as the entire uh, retirement planning concept. No. And when you get into that too, I mean, you need to look at the liquidity in the early years, um, regardless of how you structure the policy, the insurance does come at a cost and that cost is going to be greater than any fee that you're going to pay on an investment. So there is going to be liquidity in the first few years of the policy where you're going to be underwater on the amount of premiums going in. Um, versus your cash value. And I mean, maybe we can hit that crossover point a lot earlier today um, than we could have a few years ago because of the change in products and the flexibility with funding and overfunding it. But you still don't have that same liquidity that you would with traditional investments. That's it. Now, on that note, um, maybe not for, for personal, but corporately, what goes wrong here? What do you see as risks for the the business owner who's going to use an insured, um, sorry, an insurance leverage concept? Um, well, one of the things you mentioned on earlier too, um, and <laughs> where we kind of <laughs> steered away from again is the transfers. So making sure the ownership is set up correctly um, from day one is certainly good. Um, you know, if you've got it set in your opco right now and that needs to get transferred later on down the road, that could be some big taxable implications there. So getting that ownership set up from day one is good. Um, 
And then as well to making some room for some flexibility in there. I mean, I think we just went through some unprecedented changes in the market over the past couple of years and making sure you've got some flexibility to pay those premiums, even if you know, the worst happens and you're a restaurant owner and all of a sudden you can't operate your business for months out of the year. And you need to be able to get some flexibility in those premium payments. What does that flexibility look like? Is that overfund the policy and have cash value there to pay premiums or, you know, how much allowance can you give somebody like, can, can somebody get a little break on paying premiums? What's, what are you going to do there? Yeah. So, uh, any permanent policy where we are overfunding, there's going to be cash value there. Um, whole life is going to have cash value regardless. Um, but oftentimes when we're building these quotes, um, one way to build better cash value as well is to overfund it. So we will see a lot of overfunding as well. One of the things that started happening just in the past few years as well is that term riders will often increase the uh, MTAR line of an insurance policy too. So certain carriers out there are doing it in different ways, but that's certainly one thing that helps to give flexibility where, you know, maybe you're paying $50,000 a year into this, but really only 10,000 of that is required each and every year. The rest of it is all open and flexible. And of course, MTAR, the maximum tax actuarial reserve has gotten to be a bigger concern since the 2016-17 uh, changes, right? Which kind of pared back your MTAR room and gave uh, maybe a level playing field around MTAR, although you rightly say we still see uh, some manipulation there. Uh, I don't think it is manipulation, <laughs> well. um, but what happened back in 2016, and I think, you know, we kind of thought the world was ending when we saw this from an insurance standpoint, as these rules were coming into play, uh, but where it kind of changed was in the later funding. So if you were funding your policy, uh, you know, fairly heavily up front, it didn't really impact it all that much. Where it really is affecting it is if you've never overfunded your policy and all of a sudden 20 years later, you want to do a big dump into your policy. Um, that's where those big impacts happened. And of course, actually, you get a little bit more room in the first eight years under the new rules than you did in mm -hmm. the old rules, right? So, yeah. yeah, sorry, I didn't mean manipulation, maybe an negative <laughs> sense there, but, you know, using the like term insurance, I don't know that that was the intent of the legislation, that term insurance was going to uh, create MTAR room, but. Well, it does on UL and it always has. Um, yeah, I think the fair. difference there is on UL, uh, if that term writer drops off, you know, if you have a million dollars of term, million dollars of UL, after that term writer drops off, you're left with a million dollars of insurance and that MTAR room is going to be based on that. Yeah. With whole life, because you're buying paid up additions and paid up insurance as it is, or deposit option insurance with the overfunding, is that is actually increasing the actual amount of insurance on the policy. So there's a lesser impact to that MTAR room when the uh, term insurance writer drops off. Now, since we're on this subject of MTAR, since we've gone down this path, um, I see some folks talk about um, sort of making a negative ACB. Is this a concept? I don't want to take you down a uh, path you're not comfortable with here, but um, is this idea of sort of negative ACP or, you know, as you get older, grinding down ACP, ACB and creating some room there? Is this something you, you work with at all? Not really. No, actually, I actually had my first question about a negative ACB um, just this month. Oh, okay. It was the first time I had seen it. And I'm not sure what the strategy would be behind the negative ACB because it sounded like it didn't impact anything. So but. I can do this if you want here, right? We'll see what happens. Yeah, you so, let's see. <laughs> okay. So basically, um, this and this ties back to the 2017 changes because now if you're rated, right, your net cost of pure insurance is actually affected by your rating, right? It used to be mm -hmm. everybody had the same net cost of pure insurance across the board. So the ACB calculation for a given year is premiums paid minus net cost of pure insurance, right? If it's a whole life policy dividends as well, right? Mm -hmm. But essentially premiums paid minus NCPI is your change to your ACB in a year, right? Okay. So if you're 50 years old, your premiums paid are gonna be more than your NCPI for a typical 50 year old. But yes. when you're 80, your premiums paid are going to be less than your NCPI, unless it's a YRT policy, right? But in a mm -hmm. 
like in any other structure, in, in any level cost of insurance structure, your premiums paid then um, exceed your, sorry, let me get that right. Your NCPI is gonna exceed your premiums paid. Mm -hmm. So effectively you're reducing the adjusted cost basis of the policy every year, isn't just for living. Um, so now you get into the situation where the ACB comes down. Now the ACB cannot actually be less than zero. So negative ACB is a little bit of a misnomer. Oh, okay, now I get it. I was like, yeah. but if you when you calculate the actual ability to overfund the policy to put extra dollars into the policy, you're going to look retroactively at all the years of premiums paid for that policy. Mm -hmm. So if you've got an 80 year old, you would look at okay, 80, we had a zero ACB, but the NCPI was more than the premiums paid, so it was a negative contribution to the ACB calculation. At 79, it was a negative contribution to the ACB calculation. At 78, it was a negative contribution to the ACB calculation. So now you actually have a bunch of room available in the policy to dump, if you have surplus cash in the corporation, to dump that surplus cash in and stay on side for your MTAR test. Interesting. Okay, I understand where you're getting at now. Um, yeah, much smarter people than I am uh, call the actuaries to do that <laughs> stuff. Um, so, uh, but a lot of times we are able to see some of that reflected too in software. So, um, yeah, I let the software do all that. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I just, you know, it came up. <laughs> here we are. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but anyways, it it does give. It's a rare opportunity. But you know, for an mm -hmm. older person who has, you know, been paying premiums on a, especially a level cost of insurance, you will sometimes on a par whole life where there's additional deposits permitted, you can get that cash dump in then and uh, and really convert what could be taxable dollars into non-taxable dollars, which I think you have some comments about later on. Yes, Like I do. that estate <laughs> value, yeah. Um, all right, so, and uh, sorry for the uh, digression there, but. Um, <laughs> well, I actually saw a policy with a negative ACB on it. So that's where oh, I was coming from with that and didn't, oh. um, uh, for purposes of a deemed disposition, it would be just as if it had counted as zero, yeah, not yeah, that's the right. negative yeah. one. So that's where, yeah. So the negative would have been for illustration purposes, but for any tax calculation, you would use zero for the ACB. This was an enforced policy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd never seen it before. Yeah, okay. Um, so now, um, have you seen any of the, and like your restaurant owner examples are a good example here. Um, have you seen where somebody had set up a, a permanent insurance policy intending to use it for leverage and something went wrong? Something wasn't planned for properly or I don't know, what, what do you have for, for horror stories here? <laughs> um, I think the biggest one is, is when it comes to the front end leveraging and the immediate financing arrangements is just knowing the depth of underwriting uh, that you're going to get into from a financial perspective when it comes to the bank and um you know even on the insurance side as well underwriters are looking to make sure that the amount of money that you're putting into the policy makes sense um both from an income perspective today as well as what the death benefit grows to in the future um so sometimes we'll see them come back where there's some limitations on that of course there's always got to be the insurable interest there as well um, but when you're looking at it from immediate financing uh, arrangement, is that underwriting that they go through from a bank and collateral perspective is pretty intense. And they are looking at the income that's being generated through there as well. So where I have seen, uh, I guess, some horror stories go wrong is when the bank uh, didn't necessarily see it in the same way as the insurance company did. So. So did the, were the underwritings being done concurrently there or was the policy enforced before there was a recognition that the bank didn't like the deal? Uh, they went in concurrently. So I think the bank might have been a little bit behind the insurance. Um, the insurance policy was approved before the uh, financing came in through the bank. So premiums paid and then the loan doesn't come through and you get... In this case, the policy hadn't gone in force. They were waiting on the bank, um, but certainly that could be one place you could see it. Yeah, that would be ugly. Yeah. yeah. Um, any others, like you talked about ownership of the policy. 
And I'm going to assume here that you're a big fan of hold co-ownership of uh, insurance policies in this case. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because we don't want to have to see that transfer happen down the road uh, and those potential taxable implications that come in. Um, depending on when it's happening, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but there is some potential for some big taxable implications, especially depending on how old the policy is. Yeah, I think it's naive to say, and I mean, like we sold our business last summer. And, you know, if you have a, a pol an enforced policy and a permanent policy in a business that's being sold, in a corporation that's being sold, you're, you're going to have a hard time navigating that. It's just, there's no easy way around it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I've been hearing a little bit more about lately too is the insurance shares. Um, but that is some proactive planning that needs to happen as well. So, and, uh, you know, a bit of a reorg of a company too. So it's not easy to implement after the fact. hundred percent. I'm a huge fan of the insurance share concept. I think this is a great idea. Um, and I, I, I do teach it now a little bit in CFB, although it's, I think it's hard to see the value of it until you've run into these cases where, you know, things, got complicated because the insurance ownership wasn't necessarily uh, optimal, let's say. Uh, there was a great article in the Step Journal um, just a couple of weeks ago about it. Oh, if it's public, I'll attach it to the show notes. I know some stuff in Step mm -hmm. Journal is not public, so but I'll have a look. Okay. Now, what about stuff that's gone well here? I don't want to just focus on the negative. These things obviously work for most people doing them most of the time. So what have you seen go right with, uh, with these uh, leverage insurance concepts? Um, well, one thing you might think is kind of interesting is that we illustrate leveraging all the time. Um, and whether that be from the immediate financing arrangement perspective or the back end where we're doing an IRP. Uh, leveraging gets illustrated all the time, but the fact is the leveraging actually only gets utilized a very small portion of that time, um, especially on the back end leveraging. Uh, for the clients who are purchasing these, you know, as we discussed from a personal standpoint, they've got other assets. If you're putting, you know, uh, enough into a life insurance policy that you're going to have enough cash there to help use it as retirement income, you've got plenty of other assets. And when it comes to the point where, you know, they've been illustrated that they were going to start borrowing, they often don't need that income and they just let the insurance go and keep doing its thing and grow. Uh, so I think from that perspective, it's a good thing. Um, better estate values down the road, probably, or well, not probably, it would be. Um, and even on the immediate financing side of things, a lot of times people use the concept just really to say, hey, if something happens, we have this available. So, and I agree with that. I think that it's nice to plan where you have many different possible sources of retirement income. And then when it comes right down to it, what, what sources do you actually draw on? And I think mm -hmm. this happens, maybe people retire later than expected, or they're just not spending as much in retirement as expected, or maybe their investments. I think a lot of this today, their, uh, let's say their, their market investments have performed better than expected. So yeah, I would, uh, I would buy that. Again, just nice to have that as a, an additional possible source of retirement income. Absolutely. Now, you have, I think, some opinion about front-end leveraging the IFA and back-end leveraging, let's say, the IRP. Can you just go through that a little bit? Yeah, so when it comes to uh, the IFA, I know it's one of those ones that's out there that uh, really holds a lot of appeal. Um, you know, there's some ways that it's marketed that uh, I think the insurance companies heart skips a beat a couple of times when they see it um, from an IFA. We never want to say free insurance, by the way. Um, so when it comes to the IFA, I say really the point where we want to see that is when somebody's saying, hey, yes, I need this insurance. It looks great. But if I took that, let's say $100,000 and invested that into XYZ inside my company, 
I would be able to do more with that. And that's where the IFA comes into play. Uh, it's not something that's out there for, you know, kind of your everyday client. It really is for people who have really high cash flow, um, big needs for insurance. The generally you'll see what's out there is the minimum is $50,000 a year. The other thing they need to be aware of too is they need to service that interest. Um, and that interest has to be serviced. There may be an opportunity to take an additional loan at the end of the year, um, but then those loans start getting pretty out of control as well down the road. Um, and there may not be enough income there to really help with the interest deductibility as well. Uh, that is part of the strategy. I think the key there is those loans, often you're gonna see hundreds of thousands of dollars of interests and you have to be making enough money to make that like to make that much deduction make sense. That that's, Absolutely. Yeah. And the tax rate that you're illustrating it at too is important, right? So when you're illustrating an immediate financing arrangement and you're looking at that interest deductibility, it is based on, you know, if you put in um, passive income rates, it has to be taxed at that rate. So yeah. there is definitely some complications we get into down the road there. Yeah. I mean, again, that's a benefit to doing everything in the hold go, right? Because you're typically just working in one set of mm -hmm. tax rates then instead of um, mixing active and passive income and then your deductions get really messy, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, perfect. Um, and that goes to back to working with the accountant right from day one, right? So yes, absolutely. Yes. Now, um, what about... Um, in the now, I know you said like you prefer the the back end, right? The the IRP, um, but if you're going to do IFA, uh, do you have thoughts about whether we do personal borrowing or corporate borrowing? Any any opinion there? Uh, we do not illustrate personal borrowing when it comes to an IFA, so I'll just. Um, you know, from that standpoint, I, uh, I am fairly conservative and definitely there are things that there's more that could go wrong with a personal borrowing, um, on an IFA than there is with an IRP. And I mean, part of one of the benefits is, um, with the R IRP is we don't decide today, whether we're taking personal loans or corporate loans when we're selling the policy, we decide that at the time we start taking it, uh, and start taking that income. But with an IFA, there's just way more that could go wrong, uh, especially where we're going to see interest rates start rising, potential uncertainty in the economy. Um, you know, uh, the Galini case too, maybe there's, you know, a bigger benefit conferred there. There's just more that could go wrong there. Um, so we don't actually um, promote that from an insurer side or support that. Can you give us a 30 second primer on the Galini case? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Is that uh, even possible with Galini? Um, so the Galini case, and I, I know you had talked about that as well. Um, in the um, CFP, but it's essentially a very complex strategy that involved uh, insurance annuities, uh, a lot of it happening offshore as well and a very complex strategy of loans back to there where they ended up getting a shareholder benefit for the entire amount of the loan uh, conferred back to them, which was, I think, $6 million, right? Yeah, yeah, it, was so, a, yeah it, was, it was one classic uh, give an inch, take a mile, right? Where the, you know, yeah. probably it would have just worked perfectly fine if everybody just tried to work within the rules, but there was a lot of pushing at boundaries in that case. Like you said, the offshore, a really weird calculation for the shareholder benefit. Yeah, CRA did not like it. So, yeah, 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 it was not good. So, no, it's something um, we definitely keep an eye on too. Um, and there's a lot of articles out there on it. So, I I always say that you shouldn't be allowed. Now I know this is not your opinion. This is me, uh, but I think you shouldn't be allowed to do the leverage insurance concepts, the corporate insured leverage, unless you've read Golini. Like that. that <laughs> That might be setting a high bar, but the risk you're you're putting your client at if you don't sort of understand what CRA likes and doesn't like here, I think is uh, is, is quite a bit. So, 
Um, that's good. I'm glad you brought up Golini. I wasn't sure if I was going to be uh, going there or not. So thanks. <laughs> um, now, can you talk a little bit about estate impact? So what difference does it make? And you know, you have a, a corporation where they could put some money towards insurance premiums or they don't put some money towards insurance premiums. And now you fast forward you know, 20, 30, 40 years. What's the difference with the two estate outcomes there? Um, well, I mean, the insurance is, you know, I'm going to pander a guess and saying 98% of the time is going to give you better estate value to have it there. Um, I mean, where it might not is if you've got some heavily rated cases. But the great thing is, is I mean, you know, most insurers are going to have some concepts where they're able to show you that. And the way I like to walk, um, you know, a new advisor, somebody who hasn't really worked with corporate insurance, especially in that permanent market before, through kind of that first sale or through, you know, how does this work and how does this benefit is actually taking them through the product quote, which is going to be the what. So this is going to show you the numbers, show you what you could get out of it. Um, and then there's a, a concept that's going to show what happens to the estate as well, taking into consideration the net, net estate value, because the insurance is going to show you, okay, here's what I get. Uh, here's what I put in. Here's what I get. The kind of next question is, yeah, but what if I put that money into an investment? And that's where the estate concept is going to come in and show you the difference between what you would have with the insurance at the end of the day, what you would have with an investment at the end of the day. And often there's, you know, easy enough to uh, run some different comparisons there and, you know, choose different types of investments, plug in the client's tax rates. And then the leveraging comes in then when we're showing them, okay, and here's the flexibility that we could take it either to help supplement our retirement income, or if we need it up front, it's there. And I think a big part of that is if you do investments, that increases the share value. So you have you know larger share value, which means larger capital gain at death, right? Uh, potentially, yes. Potentially. Whereas yes. if you do insurance, if I take that money and put it into a UL policy, you know, I'm I'm still getting some value out of it, but it won't have the same effect on the value of the shares. And then you're going to have the death benefit paid, which doesn't increase the value of your shares, which doesn't create such a large capital gain at death. I think that's... Yeah, and cash value still may increase the value of your shares at death. There are a couple of things that come into play um, that would determine whether or not it does. And things like an estate freeze or the type of shares that are owned um, might be something that impacts that. You know, again, if insurance uh, shares are involved. There are different things that impact whether or not um, the cash value will increase the value of shares on death. Yeah. The insurance share again, there it is. So, mm -hmm. I, I like it. Now, um, any other comments around leveraged insurance? And I appreciate, Amanda, your willingness to go into some depth around this. It's very difficult in just a, a podcast format, but uh, any other comments around that? Um, for sure. So I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, kind of my Pedmas, or I guess Pedmas is now the, the name yeah, of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. But my order of operations, because I think um, one of the things out there, uh, I guess that can look more alluring to a client is when we are showing them shareholder borrowing from an IRP standpoint, right? They're going to see more money going into their pocket, less taxes paid during their lifetime. Um, but it does come down to a bit of an order of operations play, and there can be some pretty big estate impacts and benefits to actually doing that from a corporate borrowing um, perspective as well. It's a little bit simpler to um, from a tax perspective and just the, the whole setup of everything. So when we look at a corporate owned policy with corporate borrowing, really the, the company is going to own the insurance. The loan is going to be taken out by the corporation. That money goes into the corporation, and then they're going to pay their shareholder, however they paid them the day before, probably via a dividend. Um, but where things really change, and you know, because they're paying that dividend, they're paying the tax on it, and that amount going into the shareholder's pocket is going to be less. But where it really changes is how the transaction happens at death. So when we look at shareholder borrowing, a little bit different to begin with, we're going to see, again, that insurance policy owned by the corporation, but personally, I'm going to go to the bank and apply for the loan. 
and secure my corporate policy against it. Um, I'm going to have to pay my company a guarantee fee for that. But when that loan is paid out, it's going directly into my personal bank account. And I skip that um, step of having to pay it out for my company and pay that tax on the dividend, meaning I'm getting more in my bank account up front. So then at death, where this changes is when I have that corporate owned policy, we go to the bank, they've done the you know, loan corporately as well and say, okay, how much is owed on the loan? Okay, Mr. Bank, here's your amount. Here company is your amount. Um, and by the way, the CDA still remains fully intact. So if we've got a $6 million policy, our loan is 4 million, the remainder is 2 million, the bank gets there for the company gets there too, but that um, CDA is still $6 million. So if there are other assets in the company, it gives them the ability to pay those out potentially via the CDA and in a more tax efficient manner. With shareholder borrowing, in order to make sure there's no shareholder benefit conferred, that order of operations has to act a little bit different at death. And that $6 million is going to pay into the company and they're going to need to use the CDA to get that $4 million out to pay for the loan. And so they don't have the benefit of having that excess CDA available for them. Um, maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't, depending on what the assets are inside of the company. And the other thing that changes a little bit too, which we touched on earlier was the cash surrender value and it adding to the value of the shares. Uh, typically we see the leveraging done on whole life policies, um, partially too because of the amount that you can borrow against being higher than a UL policy. Um, but those are gonna have high cash values at death, especially if a client's dying somewhere around life expectancy. And with a corporate owned policy, the uh, cash value will be partially offset by the amount of the loan. And you're going to see, you know, probably a small difference there between um, the cash value and the loan. So there's just a small amount being added to the value of the shares. With uh, the shareholder borrowing, that loan isn't held inside the company. So it's not a liability there to offset it. So there could be a, uh, additional taxes and an increase to the value of those shares that they're seeing inside the company. Again, that all depends on what kind of planning has been done already. Um, and it may or may not matter. but the value that you can get out of your estate with corporate borrowing is going to be much greater than what you can get out with shareholder borrowing. I, yeah, that's good. I like that summary. That's a nice uh, breakdown. I think it's the kind of thing, it's a good explanation. And then I assume you would have illustrations to accompany that. You were going to, you send me a couple of illustrations <laughs> in advance of our conversation here. Um, so I, I actually think our illustrations don't do a good job of showing that. Um, and they don't do a good job of pointing that out actually. So really when you're looking at like the kind of fine pages and the summaries, is they're not showing that excess CDA that's available and kind of that order of operations at death. So that's something you need to know behind the scenes um, when you're looking at it and you know, which one's better? Well, depends. You know, do you need more money during your lifetime or do you want more to your estate? Um, you know, corporate borrowing is going to give you greater estate values, but it's at the detriment of the income while you're alive. And shareholder borrowing is going to give you more money while you're alive, but to the detriment of your estate. Good uh, trade off um, presentation there. I think that's good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't think that it's fair to pick on one company's illustrations here. I think that. Uh, Pretty much any illustration I've ever seen had to come with a really good explanation. That's yeah, I mean, if you read all the, the pages at the front um, and all like the little warnings, those will give you that. But I just think on the, the actual illustration itself, when you start digging into the numbers, uh, it doesn't necessarily get into those details. That's yeah, that's good. Now, can I um, do you have any other thoughts around uh, insured? Sorry, around. Uh, uh, leverage insurance strategies at all is that was good. I, I think that was a good, uh, a good summary, but anything else you, that we should have, that I should have asked you about or that you wanted to share? I think that's, I think that's it. I mean, 
you know, there's kind of the different ways you can do it. Um, the good part about IRPs, you don't need to make the decision today. And even with IFAs, again, it's a great way to show the flexibility if you have somebody um, who might be interested, but isn't sure they want to fully commit to those premiums right now. But you know that that cash flow will be there uh, to pay for the premiums. Now, my, my last question for you here. So I get a lot of questions like from former students, that kind of thing, even sometimes from people I've never met before, um, <laughs> where I think like that's a question that you really should be asking the client's accountant, right? And sometimes I'll come back with that. I'll say, well, has the client talked to their accountant? And uh, for a variety of reasons, no, but whatever, we, I try to rectify that. Um, what kind of questions do you get or how far do you feel like you can go in answering questions versus you having to say, okay, like I know you're a good client, but that's a question that really should go to tax lawyer or should go to the client's accountant or how do you kind of massage that? Um, so I'm able to give you generic advice on how uh, things work. And I, I mean, maybe not advice either, but I'm able to give you generic information on how these things work. Um, I do use a lot of the white papers very often uh, to make sure that anything that I'm saying is being backed up by those. But when it comes to specific situations, that's where the client needs to involve their accountant because exactly why we don't show, you know, that bump in CDA potentially that's there is we don't know what planning the client has done. And that's where they need to consult their team of professionals and their legal team and their accounting team to see how this applies to themselves. Um, because we just don't know what planning has been done and we can't give out that legal or accounting advice. Perfect. Okay. Um, you've been great, Amanda. Really appreciate your willingness to go into some pretty hardcore depth here to really nerd out on uh, some insurance and tax planning issues. Uh, any last minute comments for us? Um, you know, I think um, if you're interested in learning more about it, make sure you're engaging with those who are out there to help you, whether it's your wholesalers or your firms, just um, reach out and attend as many sessions, I guess, as possible. Uh, keep on learning. There's lots of uh, material out there to kind of do that research and listen to those tracks. And sometimes you need to listen to it over and over again a few times to really get that, that understanding of it. Um, and of course, um, you know, make sure you do your CFP and CLU with Jason because he's the best. That's not why I brought you on, but I appreciate you. Amanda. Um, I do think there'll be a couple of people who listen to this episode at least a couple of times because uh, there's concepts here worth understanding. Um, and and I, I don't hear that very often, your, your sort of trade-off uh, around personal borrowing versus corporate borrowing and then how it impacts estate values. But I thought that was really, really well thought through. Thanks. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And I mean, asterisks depends on what the kind of planning <laughs> the client's already done. Ask their account and get them involved as early as possible. Uh, and it, when it does come time to make that decision too, make sure you are uh, talking with the accountant because they'll be the ones that'll be able to give the best insight on it too. And, you know, is there a problem with the guarantee fee and what is reasonable and where do things stand at with the Galini case? Um, but make sure you're involving the client's accountant to give them the best advice that's possible as to how to go about that and take those loans. That's great. Okay. Thanks so much, Amanda. Let's uh, have a wonderful day. And I know you and I'll be in touch regularly. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Lots there. Lots of technical stuff. I would encourage you to have a look at the um, show notes for this episode. There's lots of good supplemental resources in the show notes. Okay, the uh, number for today's episode is seven. The number is seven. I hope you'll join me again in two weeks when we'll have Ray Zadri back. Ray is going to talk about his experiences um, with his child who has a disability and what he did to sort of manage his, uh, his child's transition from uh, childhood to adulthood. Um, in the meantime, enjoy your continued studies. Thanks very much. Thanks for watching. Use the link in the description down below to join our CE program. With many of our videos, subscribers can do a short quiz for CE credits and you'll have access to our full library of content.